I am a disabled African-American woman. And the first thing I told my assigned advocate when I got a positive COVID test back was that the only clean pair of underwear I had was the one I was currently wearing and a stray one of my sister's. Yes, I stared down a global pandemic in the face with a needle in my chest that needed to get taken out an incision infection from a procedure a month prior, and with the knowledge that this virus could very well kill me in less than 10 days. And I was concerned about the fact that I was about to go into isolation with no underwear. Or worse, have to wear my sister's. Now, before you can understand why this is even a concern on my mind, let's backtrack a little bit. So let me reintroduce myself to you. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm the daughter of two African-American immigrants, and I was born a very sick child. I learned how to walk with two casts on my legs. My mother would cart me to my, my little baby self to the ER once a week for various medical issues. I learned that I had asthma about a year and a half after I got an asthma diagnosis, which happened to be about a couple months after I got those same casts taken off my feet. And that more or less is the story of my life. From one medical issue to the next to the next, I watched myself go from an athlete spending hours and hours in the gym to a high schooler barely able to walk across campus. And every specialist appointment met more or less the same way. First, a reading of my file, a comment on how young I was, then assurance that they wouldn't be the doctor who abandoned me, at least not until we got answers. Then came the labs. I would get poked and prodded in various states of undress. And those labs would come back. And we would either find nothing or we would find something that was a little strange, but not strange enough for us to pin down that it was causing exactly what I was experiencing. So then I would be told that the melanin in my skin made it impossible for me to have a disease, or that my poverty meant that I was doing it for money, or that my femininity wasn't strong enough to hold my body together. And those were the doctors that tried. I have an even longer list of the doctors that took one look at a teenager, a girl, and made up every excuse in the book to not even try. Ultimately, it wasn't a doctor that figured out what was going on. It was my best friend. She sent me a link one day to the name of a disease, a disease that was way too rare for me to possibly have, but one she figured I should look into anyway. And one just scan of the Google search explained my entire life, from the asthma to the feet to the ER visits, even the things I didn't realize were, were essentially connected, like my stomach issues and my eye issues and my dislocated shoulder. So I did what most people do. I brought my concerns to my primary care physician at the time, and she took one look at me and asked me why I was so obsessed with getting a diagnosis. Was I looking to get disability? Was I looking to take advantage of a system that was built for bodies more broken than I claimed to be? I am very lucky, privileged even, to have gotten a diagnosis even though it took 21 years. I'm even privileged to know about all the rare comorbidities that come along with it. Again, privileged. But this isn't what this talk is about. This talk is about how when I was in high school, I was given four antibiotics 
for an inspection I may or may not have even had, four antibiotics that all reacted with each other and turned my GI tract into a chemistry experiment gone wrong. It's about how when I was 16, in an ER, I was told to go through with a test that I was totally uncomfortable with doing, but was pressured to do it anyway because that doctor told me that if I was in as much pain as I said I was in, that I would do absolutely anything to make it stop. It's about how not even a year and a half ago, I waited three months with a kidney stone in my right kidney before going to seek help about it. Because I didn't want to go to an ER to be called dramatic or drug seeking again. It's about how I'm not alone in this. Hashtags such as hashtag patients are not faking, hashtag med trauma, and hashtag doctors are dickheads. Yes, this is a real hashtag that people use are filled with people telling their stories of their neglect in the healthcare system. These neglects range from biases based on appearance, sex, gender identity, even appearance. But that's the internet. You could say anything on the internet. How much of this is actually true? Well, an article published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine entitled Physicians and Implicit Bias, how doctors may unwittingly perpetrate healthcare disparities had physicians complete something called the Implicit Association Test, or the IAT. They had doctors sit at a computer and sort various images of people into two categories, black and white, and then again, into words such as joy, wonderful, glorious, and horrible, agony, evil. If that left an unpleasant taste in your mouth, don't worry, it left one in mine too. But what was interesting was the outcome of this study found that every single doctor had a significant pro-white bias, even in the absence of explicit bias. And this was directly linked with doctors' perception of patient compliance. Actually, scratch that. Not every doctor. African-American doctors were found to be more or less neutral, and women were found to have a less significant bias, but still there anyway. The study was later repeated with obese patients and found to find more or less the same correlation. Scary, right? But here's the deal. This study actually got a lot of criticism, specifically in the use of the IAT. They said that the IAT was not an appropriate or accurate measure of these implicit biases, which is fair. Not every test is perfect, not every study is perfect, and not every measure of success or numbers can even really quantify a lot of things. But here's the deal. These biases show up in other statistics, even if we can't quantify the bias itself. So, for instance, the Journal of the American Medical Association found that in black children under the age of 21 who had appendicitis were only about 20.7% likely to receive opioids for their pain in a hospital setting, a frontline treatment for said pain, while with their white counterparts, it was closer to about 43.1%. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network found that Latine men with high-risk localized prostate cancer were less likely to receive treatment, definite treatment, than their non-white Latine counterparts. And the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America found that clinical penalties for black newborns when cared for by black physicians were almost halved than black newborns being cared for by white physicians. And these trends ring true across various biases, from gender identity to biological sex to even appearance. And when you tack on intersectionality, such as disabled Hispanic men or queer white women, we find that these statistics get worse and worse. 
closer and closer to a death sentence. Now, this is not me telling you not to go to a doctor. Please go to a doctor. This is also not me telling you that all healthcare physicians are bad because they aren't. But the reality is this. These biases are here, and they are even more present than we realize. Because you know what I don't know? And granted, I don't know a lot of things. I don't know a single person who is chronically ill or disabled, who has gone through the medical system and haven't come out with some sort of medical trauma because of these implicit biases. But what I do know is many disabled individuals who end up sexually assaulted by medical physicians in order to get help. I know multiple, Ill, chron multiple chronically ill people of color who were told that they couldn't have their disease because it's inherently a white person disease. I know too many people who have gone into ERs and had their pain completely blown off when their organs were dying inside of them. And I know too many people who died because it was too late for them. Because these biases make it hard for us to be seen as people, people worthy of saving and instead seen as inconveniences of a system that isn't meant for us. And I promise you that you could put any chronically ill and disabled person on this stage and get a similar story about how the medical system failed them over and over and over again. So let me reintroduce myself to you. Hi, I'm Sophia. I am one of four people in the United States who has a disability. I am one of 10 with a rare disease. I know ER protocols better than I know my best friends and they don't let me forget it. But I'm also a really big Percy Jackson nerd, right? If you put me and a bee in a parking lot, I would rather eat my own shoe. I know musicals way better than I know the latest pop hits. And I am a best friend. I am a sister, I am a daughter, I am an activist. And I got my panties in a twist when I got a positive COVID test back because I know that something as insignificant as the smell of dirty underwear could be the difference between me being seen as a person and getting the care that I deserve and me not being taken seriously if I were to have a life-threatening complication in an ER. Because my existence is conditional. And it shouldn't have to be. Thank you.